Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we're gonna to be doing something similarly that we have done in the past where I'm gonna walk you through a math lesson with one of my kiddos. So today I have with me Isaiah. So this is Isaiah and he is in third grade. And so we are going to walk you through um, our Saxon math lesson. He is in 5-4, um, probably broken record here, but I've said before that um, this is more appropriate for a third grade level in our experience. You can go online and take a placement test, find out what would best suit your kid. But um, for our experience and what we have seen, the 5-4 is very close to what you would be doing in a third grade level so we're just gonna kind of walk you through and show you how we go through a math lesson using Saxon math um, 5-4 so you'll see that I have it tabbed this is the level in which it really changes from the spiral approach so if you're unfamiliar with the spiral approach you'll want to go back and watch the Saxon math lesson that I did with my first grader it really walks you through how the spiral approach goes where um, the worksheets are provided for you and you go through a lesson and then all of the problems are on a worksheet. And this is different. This really is starting to move more toward a textbook style math lesson. So this is what the, we always tab it so we know what lesson we are on. So this is what it looks like. And so it tells you the lesson number at the top. Sorry, I'm blocking him. <laughs> so it tells you we are in lesson 59. It tells you that we are estimating arithmetic <laughs> answers for this lesson. That's kind of what we're going to be covering. We have a warm up that we do each day before we actually get to the new concept in the lesson where we're doing some um, fact practice and we're doing some mental math and some problem solving problems. Then once we get through this warm up where I'm working with him, um, we get to the new concept. Again, with this, I am reading it with him. I'm going over all the concepts with him, making sure that he understands. Once we get through the new concept, then we get to the lesson practice. So the lesson practice specifically covers their problems that go with that day's lesson. So it is merely a quick check to make sure that the things that you just introduced, that your kiddo has a grasp on it before you move on. If they weren't able to answer these problems, you might need to go and find a few extra problems, you know, in the lesson or the mixed practice to make sure that they are getting it. But it's just going to give you a gauge as to whether or not they got what you taught them that day. So I always do this with him uh, immediately following the lesson. I wanna know, did he get it? Do we need to go over something again? Something not clicking. It's just like your first way of, of knowing whether or not they're ready to move on. So once we go over that lesson practice, then we move to the mixed practice, like I just said. So the mixed practice, at least in this textbook, usually covers about 27, 28 problems every day. And it is, just like it says, mixed practice in that it is covering a mixture of problems from previous lessons as well as current lessons. And under each problem, See how it says problem one, problem two. Underneath there are some things, some numbers in parentheses, and that tells you what lesson that problem relates to. So if your kiddo is looking at number one and they're like, I don't know how to do it, underneath the number one, it has the number 49 in a parenthesis, which is telling you that was taught, that concept was taught in lesson 49. So if you are unsure, if you want to go back and cover something, you'd head back to lesson 49, and that would be where you would go over that concept again to make sure that they have it. So that is nice when you're unsure, if you're wanting to redirect them, kind of teaching you know, them how to maybe go and look for the answer themselves rather than always relying on you. I do that a little less with him, a little bit more with my fifth grader. I've taught him, okay, you know, that lesson number under the problem is going to tell you where you can go and get a little bit more information. So um, this, we kind of are touch and go as to whether or not we let him do the work on his own. Sometimes, depending on the day, we will sit with him and we will make sure that um, we are just checking his problems as he goes. We are slowly and we are slowly trying to wean him into doing this work on his own. So um, 
once we get through that lesson practice and he's ready to start the mixed practice, we are starting to send him into the schoolroom or into the the dining table or wherever he can be by himself so he can focus and do these problems on his own. I mean, that is a skill in and of itself. While you are trying to read a problem here, this isn't a, is this in a worksheet. So this is, I am going to, I use this book for my eldest and I will use it for the next two kids as long as it continues to be a math curriculum that works for our family. But he's not writing any of the answers here. He has his own math um, notebook here where he is writing down the problems and the answers and all of his work in a workbook or not a workbook but his notebook so that's a skill in and of themselves in and of itself to be able to look at a textbook and then be able to take that problem and copy it over to a notebook so when we started out doing this curriculum with him he was used to having a worksheet with all of his problems right there. So for the first 50 lessons, I sat with him and would remind him, okay, we're here. Let's focus here. Let's do this problem. We're only doing the evens today. We're only doing the odds. So I always tie that to our lesson number. So our lesson is 59. So today we're only going to be doing the odd numbers. So if we were on an even lesson, we would only do the even numbers. We'd kind of just... Don't think that all 28 problems are necessary to make sure because it is constantly reviewing that review is built in. I don't think it's truly necessary that he has to do all the problems every day. So that is a skill though, to be able to read the problem, to be able to take the problem into his notebook and to be able to solve it, make sure he's copying the right numbers down. We've worked a lot on that, making sure that we're copying the numbers and the problems, the formulas, all those things are going from the book to his notebook and they are copied correctly. So um, be patient with your kiddos if um, you're, you're seeing that they're struggling with that. I do know that I tried to push independence on my oldest a lot sooner than I am with him because I learned that while that may seem really simple for me as a skill, as an adult, it is a learned skill and he really struggled with it and I got really frustrated the, when I was going through it with my eldest and I finally realized I was really trying to push him into something that he just wasn't quite ready for. So I kind of learned from that experience and I'm just sharing it with you in case you are seeing some frustration where you know, why can't you just, you know, find your problem, write it in your notebook and do it. Um, seems easy. It's just not yet for them. So um, if you're seeing that, maybe sit with them, help point out what problem they're on, correcting them as they go, showing them how to write in a notebook so that the problems aren't crazy and all over the place. It's orderly and organized. That was a skill to be learned as well. So those are the kinds of things that we're going over. So we're going to go ahead and just show you and walk you through how we actually go over the lesson, how he participates and what we do. So let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And as I said before, we start with a warm up, which is nearly just some mental math where he looks at the problem. We're not writing them down. He's just going to try and you know, get the juices flowing. He's going to do all the work in his brain. And I wanted to point out one thing. As you get to some of these books, they might be more mental math than maybe you want to. You know, it's early in the morning, maybe you don't have enough coffee yet or whatever the case is and your, your juices aren't flowing either. Sometimes, not so much with this one, but as my eldest gets higher and higher, sometimes I am just not ready to be doing the mental math that they are doing um, so early in the morning. So I just wanted to point out when you buy it, you can also buy the key. And the key is great because of course, it has all the answers to all the problems, but it also has the answers to the warm up for the mental math. So if you're just like not feeling it that morning or you're just like got a lot going on, it's hard for you to focus to do that mental math. I am a pencil and paper kind of person. I don't think I was ever really taught the skill of mental math personally, but um, sometimes at least with my eldest, I like to have it there to make sure that I am giving him the right answer. So if you're not, if strength, if math is not your strength, don't worry, there is an answer key even for these mental math problems. So let's go ahead and get started. 
All right, so here we are focusing on this warm up section, and we have our mental math problems where we're focusing, at least for the this current lesson, we are focusing on dollars and adding and subtracting some unusual numbers um, by rounding and doing some little mind tricks to do, which they have taught in previous lessons, but this is just kind of compiling on it and making sure that we're sticking with those skills. All right, so Isaiah, let's look at A. Let's do subtract the dollars and cents from dollars. $5 minus $3.95. Good. All right. $5 minus $1.39. $3.69. Good. Very good. Yep. All right, now we're going with 10. So $10 minus $8.75. $1.25. Yeah, there you go. $1.25. Now we're going to do some adding. So here we have the trick of we're going to round 298 to what? $3. $3. And then we're going to add the $3 to here. So that becomes what? 736 oh. and if I can do subtraction, 734. Very good. Yep. $7.34 once we subtract those last two. Okay, what about here? $1. Okay. So I'm going to subtract how, how will I get to 200. If I have 400 minus 100, that's going to take me to 300. 300. And then I have 75 minus 25, 50. So then I have 300, 350. 350. Good. All right. Now we've got three problems or three numbers that we're going to add together. Okay. 66. 366, good. 566. Very good. So a lot of times we have these problem solving problems and we just kind of gauge whether or not we want to do those depending on the day or, you know, what, what the problem is if I feel that it is going to be beneficial or if we've kind of mastered that area, we kind of pick and choose whether or not we want to do that, which is totally up to you and your family, your kids' skills, and what the, you feel that they need to keep working on. So we did the warm up and now we are moving into the con the new concept um, of our textbook here. So today we're learning about estimates. So I'll we'll just scoot over here. All right, so here at this point, I just read to them and then we go through these examples where it is illustrating the concept that we read about. A lot of times I will cover up the answer so that he doesn't see it and he can kind of work through it on his own. So this is the point at which I just read it through it with him. We can estimate arithmetic answers by using rounded numbers instead of exact numbers to do the arithmetic. <music> So we can use an estimate to make sure, say, like when we're adding something, we're like, well, does it make sense? Is that in, the, in a close enough number? Want to kind of check what we've, what we've done. So here this one, Isaiah, is asking us to estimate the sum of 396 and 512. So the solution says... To estimate, first we're going to change the exact numbers to round numbers. We round, what do you think we're going to round 396 to? 400. 400. It's really close. And then we could say in 512. What do you think we should round 512 to? 500. Okay, so if we were going to round 300 to 400, so we have 400 and 500, what would, our, what would they be if we added them, 400 and 500? 900. So it's saying here that the estimated sum of 396 and 512 is 900. Now the exact sum, so when I truly add them together, it's 908. So the estimated answer does not equal the exact answer, but it's pretty close, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So it was a little easier to do in our head to the 400 and 500, but it was still pretty close, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we have a couple more examples to go through. exact one was larger. So when we rounded down, it became less than the exact number. Our estimated number was less because we rounded down. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now here it says to estimate seven times 365. So which one was going to be more? 
Yes, and that one was the estimate because he rounded it. So Bill's estimate was more than the actual product of seven times 365 because he rounded 365 up to 400. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, now here, this one says, estimate the answer to 43 divided by eight. So then the answer to 43 divided by eight must be somewhere in between five and six. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so that is it. We covered the entire new concept of our lesson. We did the warm up, the mental math, we did our new concepts here and went over some examples. Now it leads us to our lesson practice. If it's something that he can do mentally, I will just sit and we'll go over the problems um, and he'll just tell me the answers verbally. If it is something that he might need to be writing down, then we go ahead and we grab his notebook. He gets a pencil and he writes those answers out in his notebook as well as the mixed practice to follow. So we'll just go ahead and go over these um, lesson practice to make sure that he gets these concepts and then we will move on to our mixed practice. So for this particular lesson, um, he is going to need to do some writing. So we already have, I usually make a header on his notebook paper for each lesson, also reminding him um, if he's gonna be doing the evens or the odds so he knows which ones to do. But for this one, since it's asking for the estimated answer as well as the exact answer, we're at least gonna have to be doing the exact answer in writing. So we're gonna go ahead and go over this lesson practice. And then once he's finished with that, I will turn him loose to let him work on the mixed practice. And usually I will go ahead and grade that pretty much immediately following once he is completed. It might be, you know, give or take 15, 20 minutes, depending on if I'm working with another child, but I usually try to do it pretty quick after he's done before he kind of runs loose and gets onto something else. That way it's immediate feedback. He knows if he's missed something or, you're out of the screen, I can't see you. If he's missed something so that we can correct it, we can uh, talk over why or how he missed that problem. And it's just immediate feedback. So he's not, you know, we're not doing it the next day and he can't even remember why he did or wrote or, you know, did a problem a certain way. So I do like him to have that immediate feedback, but he will be doing this on his own. So we're going to go ahead and do that lesson practice. I'll turn him loose and we will be completely done with our math lesson for the day. Wasn't too bad, was it? No. All right, guys, that's all I have for today. Thanks for joining us as we walk through Isaiah's math lesson. We hope you enjoyed it. But as usual, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them for you. And until next time, have a blessed day. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, guys.